Hey guys and welcome back for another mystery where today we're going to be tackling a story that you've probably heard of but do you know the full story? The name Lizzie Borden is somewhat of a legend. There's movies and TV shows and songs written about her all taking for granted that she definitely killed her family in cold blood. Lizzie Borden, the axe murderer. But Lizzie was actually acquitted at trial. She was found to be not guilty and opinions have been divided ever since. Did she do it or did she not? There must be more to the story, right? And what if she didn't do it at all? That's what we're going to explore today. There's a famous children's rhyme, which every source I read says it's very well known, something every generation knows. However, I can only assume this is an American thing because it's not a rhyme I can say I'd ever heard of here in England. So Americans, let me know. The rhyme goes, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Unsurprisingly, this rhyme doesn't quite have the facts right. The murder weapon was a hatchet, not an axe. She didn't kill her mother, she maybe killed her stepmother, and it wasn't quite as brutal as 40 wax each. And of course, a huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this week's video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creative and curious people. With Skillshare, you can explore new skills, develop existing interests, and get lost in your creativity. You know I always love recommending you the latest classes I've been watching and enjoying and this time I have for you Document Your Life, Four Methods to Live More Intentionally by Nathaniel Drew. I've recommended Nathaniel Drew's classes before, I love his YouTube channel and his Skillshare classes are no exception. He really teaches you how to make the most of every moment and not waste a second. This class of his explores the concept of intentional documentation, how to capture pieces of your life in a thoughtful way, giving you memories to look back on forever. This really appealed to me because I've done nothing with this last year of my life thanks to the pandemic, and I'm sure many of you are also the same, and I've made a vow to do everything I can this summer and beyond. I want to make memories with my loved ones and I want to make sure I remember them. Nathaniel teaches you how to do this in an artistic and intentional way through vlogging, journaling, photography and reporting your own life. This class goes deeper than just snapping a photo on your phone. I don't want to see life through the screen of my iPhone. I want to live it and create memories on the way. Creative challenges and productivity classes can be a great way to help you structure your time and set up achievable goals. Whether you're wanting to just fend off boredom, focus on self-care through creativity, learn how to use your skills for social good, or just become part of a creative and encouraging community, Skillshare is the best place for you. Whatever you're interested in learning about, I can almost guarantee there's a class waiting for you on Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use a link in my description to sign up to Skillshare will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, and then after that, it's only around $10 or £7 a month. Let us begin by setting the scene. Our story takes place in Fall River, Massachusetts. Today, Fall River, which is a city about 50 miles south of Boston, has a population of around 90,000 people. But 130 years ago, when all of this happened, it was just marginally smaller, with over 74,000 people which is a pretty big town by the standards of the 1800s, likely due to the booming textile mill industry in the area. Even to this day, Fall River is a predominantly Roman Catholic city, and there seemed to be a lot of Catholics immigrating into the area around the time the Bordens lived there. You can imagine the shockwaves that spread through the town or the city in the aftermath of this story. The characters of this story are obviously the Borden family. Lizzie Andrew Borden was born on the 19th of July 1860, the youngest daughter of Andrew Borden and Sarah Morse Borden. She had an older sister by 10 years, Emma Leonora, and another older sister called Alice, who sadly died at the age of two. Their mother Sarah sadly died shortly after Lizzie was born from what her death certificate said was uterine congestion. Andrew was now a widow with two children to raise, but luckily for him, he was a fairly well-off man. 
A lot of reports describe Andrew as being super wealthy, but he wasn't quite a multi-millionaire tycoon as many were in Fall River, including many of his relatives. Andrew had taken advantage of the booming textiles industry in the area, and he did certainly have his fair share of money, the Borden family weren't exactly struggling. But apparently Andrew was a frugal man, some might describe him as tight. The Borden family lived very modestly, despite the money it was known that Andrew had. By this point, indoor bathrooms and plumbing, telephones and electric lighting were fairly commonplace. The Borden house had none of these things. He purchased 92 Second Street, now known infamously as the Borden House, in 1873, and cut as many corners as he could in the construction or the renovation, I should say, of the house. The house is said to have a distinct lack of hallways, perhaps because Andrew wanted to keep the construction costs down. Before the Bordens moved in, it was also said to be two separate tenements, and when the Bordens moved in, Andrew just put doors between the two sides of the house. Now, Andrew wasn't said to be the best man in the world. He did own a lot of property around Fall River and was said to be quite harsh on his tenants and the people who worked for him. He would tax them as much as he could, work them as hard as he could, and would always stand firm in his decisions. Whilst you tend to think of the 1800s as being a harsh time in general, Andrew Borden was said to be harsh even for the times. He was raised in the 1840s where you had to work hard and take whatever money you could get. By the 90s though, this way of being was somewhat outdated. But a way in which he wasn't the stereotypical Victorian man is in his relationship with his daughters. I don't think you can accuse Andrew of being a cold or absent father, and his daughters did love him. After Lizzie graduated from high school, she gave her father her class ring, which he would then wear until his dying day. Apparently, he also paid for her to take a European tour after she turned 30 as well, which I can imagine would have been a huge gesture from him considering how frugal we've already covered that he was. But everything was not so happy in the Borden household. After the tragic death of his first wife and the mother of his daughters, Sarah, Andrew remarried to Abby Durfee Gray, making her Abby Durfee Borden. There seems to be a lot of conflicting views on the internet as to the exact kind of relationship the girls had with their new stepmother. She came into their lives when Lizzie was just five years old and Emma was 14. Lizzie barely would have remembered her actual mother, so I can't imagine she would have objected too much to this new marriage, but Emma, on the other hand, did remember their mother. For the most part, it seems like they were all content enough with their lives though. They just had a standard stepmother-stepdaughter relationship. Abby was 37 at the time she married Andrew, so she was very much a spinster by the time standards. She likely would have thought she had very much lucked out marrying at such a late age to a wealthy man. And it does seem like Lizzie did call Abby mother from a young age. Emma, however, did not, settling on just calling her Abby. Abby ran a very tight ship at home and the girls were expected to do their part, do chores etc and as they got older they did begin to resent this. Neither Emma nor Lizzie would ever marry and they became spinsters themselves. At the time the bulk of this story takes place, Lizzie would have been 32 and Emma around 42. I suppose most women back in this time would have needed to marry for money, but the boarding girls didn't really have that issue. Their father had enough money to go around and they probably knew that they had a significant inheritance waiting for them upon his death. And it seems like this inheritance, or at least money, might have been the issue that led to the breakdown in the relationship between Abby Borden and her stepdaughters. Around 1890, it seems that Andrew bought Abby a share in her half-sister's house, or some other sources state that he just bought Abby's sister a house outright, I'm not too sure which one is correct there. But regardless, he bought a house on Abby's side of the family and his daughters were not happy about it. Why was he seeming to care more about his wife's family than his own children? It seems that Lizzie always resented that their father had bought the house on 2nd Street instead of on the hill, which was the fanciest part of town. He could afford to live on the hill, so why did he not? Why did he have to live so frugally and bring his daughters down with him? So, Lizzie and Emma demand that their father sells them one of his rental houses, which they purchase off of him for just one dollar. 
Only five years later, they sell it back to him for $5,000, which is the equivalent to about 150,000 today. And this was only a number of weeks before his death. Around this same time, it seems that Lizzie stopped calling Abby mother as she had done for many years and instead started calling her Mrs. Borden. At the later murder inquest, Lizzie would say that this name change came around as a result of difference of opinion. Things were turning sour to say the least. And this all happened sort of towards the end of the 1880s. It was shortly after this, Lizzie went on her trip around Europe with some other women from Fall River for the first time ever seeing what life could be like outside of her hometown. Not long after Lizzie returned from Europe, a strange thing happened at the Borden house. In June 1891, there was a burglary. Some jewellery, money and streetcar tickets were stolen from the master bedroom, Andrew and Abby's room. You often hear in old stories about how families would leave their doors unlocked and their windows open, unafraid of crime and their neighbours. Well, Andrew Borden wasn't really that kind of guy. He had way too much money to be thinking like that. This house was usually locked up, but after the burglary, he began to be extra safe, locking even the bedroom. Strangely though, at this point, he would begin to leave the bedroom key on the mantelpiece in the lounge, just in plain sight of everyone in the house. This has led to people suspecting that Andrew thought, or knew, it was Lizzie who had been responsible, that he left the key there to taunt her. If the key moved or if anything more went missing, it would have been obvious who did it. It seems that this never happened again in their home, but Lizzie did seem to have a bit of a penchant for shoplifting, something that Andrew was apparently constantly paying local shopkeepers to keep quiet about paying for the stolen goods. Now something that is very important to know about Lizzie Borden is that she loved animals. She loved them. So much so that after her eventual death, she left a significant amount of money to an animal rights charity. There was a barn on the Borden property in which a number of pigeons would roost, and Lizzie would reportedly spend a lot of time in this barn with the pigeons. Around the same time as the burglary, before or after, we don't quite know, it's thought that one afternoon Andrew went into the barn and killed a number of the pigeons, bringing their decapitated bodies back into the house. We have no way of knowing whether Andrew did this purposefully to upset Lizzie. Perhaps it was in response to the burglary he suspected she'd committed, or if the burglary might have been a response to Andrew killing the pigeons. Or maybe he had another reason to kill the pigeons. Many do view them as vermin and you probably don't want them taking over your barn. What we do know is that this whole thing, the killing of the pigeons, really distressed Lizzie. Suffice to say, things were pretty tense in the Borden household. And so we fast forward a year to August 1892. At the beginning of the month, the entire household had been violently ill with some kind of sickness bug. At the time, Abby suspected that the family were being poisoned. Andrew wasn't exactly the most well-liked person in the town and had a lot of business, I feel like enemies is too strong a word, but lots of rival businessmen who weren't fans of him. She thought their bread had been tainted. However, it was later speculated that what they actually had was food poisoning. It wasn't uncommon for one joint of meat to last a family several days in the Borden's time, and they had mutton left on the stove that they'd been working their way through for a number of days. Of course, there's no way of knowing for sure now what exactly was making the family sick, although it is worth noting that Bridget, the family's maid, didn't get ill until the day of the murders. Just the night before, she'd gone out to visit a friend, and on her return home, she poured herself a glass of milk. The next morning, she was vomiting, and she was the last one in the family to get sick. Perhaps it was just a slow-burning sickness bug, perhaps it was food poisoning from the mutton, or perhaps someone was indeed poisoning the milk or the bread. But with that, we come to just the day before the murders took place, with the arrival of Lizzie's uncle, John Morse, into town. John Morse was the brother of her mother Sarah and he'd come to visit the Bordens to discuss some business with Andrew. He arrived on the afternoon of the 3rd of August 1982 before going to visit some other relatives for dinner, arriving back at the Borden house not long before 9pm that night. 
John would later say that that evening Lizzie had been out with her friend Alice Russell and they'd heard her come home, but she didn't come into the sitting room and say hi. Andrew and John discussed business all evening until about 10pm, at which point they went to bed. Andrew in his bedroom and John in the guest room. As I mentioned, Lizzie had been out with her friend Alice that night, who lived just around the corner. Alice was quite close to the Borden family, she'd grown up next door to them and was also very close with Emma. Apparently Lizzie was very jumpy that night, she seemed agitated and had a feeling that something terrible was going to happen. Lizzie told Alice that her whole family had been sick for quite a few days and they were worried that someone had poisoned their bread or their milk, perhaps one of her father's business rivals. Lizzie claimed that she'd been sleeping with one eye open recently, worried that someone was going to burn the house down in the middle of the night, as she'd seen some suspicious people hanging around outside the house. They spoke about her concerns for about two hours before Lizzie eventually headed back home. And it seems that the next day, the 4th of August, Lizzie's prophecy would come true. The day would begin as usual around 6am for the Borden's household maid, Bridget Sullivan. Bridget had worked for the family for a few years at this point, and she was often actually referred to as Maggie by the girls. We don't quite know why this was, some speculate they had a previous maid called Maggie, so they decided to call Bridget by the same name, or perhaps it was just condescension. Maggie was said to be a very stereotypical name for an Irish servant. Bridget lived in the home and did a lot of these sort of general household chores, washing the clothes, cooking, sweeping, shopping, but she didn't do everything. Lizzie and Emma were still expected to pull their weight when they were around. You'll notice no mention of Emma being around at this time though. In the middle of July, she'd gone to visit some friends in Fairhaven and was still there on the day of the murders. She didn't arrive home until she received a telegram saying what had happened. On the morning of the 4th of August, 1892, Bridget arises around the same time as John Morse and heads downstairs to get things started in the kitchen. John Morse heads to the sitting room. Eventually, Andrew and Abby come down and they will have some breakfast, including some of that leftover mutton. Bridget hadn't seemed to have caught the same illness as everyone else in the household up to this point, but she reported that, that morning she began to feel nauseous and headachey. After breakfast, she would begin vomiting. No one heard anything from Lizzie that morning until after John Morse had already left to go and visit other family in Fall River, leaving just before 9am and intending to arrive back at the Bordens for lunch. At around half nine, Abby put Bridget to work for the day, telling her to wash the windows both inside and out on the ground floor. So that's what she does, telling Lizzie not to bother locking the doors to the house because she's going to be in and out getting fresh water for the window cleaning. By this point in the day, Andrew had already left the house to go for a walk, so inside the house would have only been Abby and Lizzie. After his walk, Andrew heads back home, probably around 10am. He had a bit of trouble getting to the house, so he had to knock for Bridget to let him in, and even she struggled with the lock it seems at this point. As she's struggling to get the lock open, she hears Lizzie giggling at the top of the stairs, which is important because it places her upstairs at this time. Upon entering, Andrew asked Lizzie where Abby was and she says that she'd received a note from a sick friend and had gone to visit her. No such note was ever found in the house and investigators were never able to locate a friend who had written such a note. From there, Andrew eventually sits down to relax in the sitting room. Bridget later testifies that she saw Lizzie helping him down onto the sofa and Lizzie would testify that she watched him remove his boots and put on slippers, although crime scene photos show that he was still in his boots at the time of his death. After Andrew was comfortable, Lizzie then went to iron some handkerchiefs in the dining room, where she chatted with Bridget. Bridget then headed upstairs to go put away some of her cleaning bits, despite Lizzie trying to convince her to check out a sale at the local department store. Now it's at this point where we have a couple of different timelines to follow. So let's start with what we know for sure. Shortly after 11am, Bridget was resting in bed when she heard Lizzie calling her saying, Maggie, come quick, father is dead, someone has come in and killed him. Bridget rushed downstairs and found Andrew still on the sofa, but now his head and face had been smashed in with a hatchet. Investigations would later show 10 or 11 separate blows. 
Lizzie told Bridget to go off across the street and fetch Dr. Bauer and the family's doctor, but he wasn't at home, so she left a message with his wife. Lizzie then told her to go and get Alice Russell, the friend that she'd spent the previous evening with. Lizzie waited by the open doorway for Bridget to return with Alice, telling neighbours of what had happened. It seems to be one of these neighbours who alerted the local police station, who received a call around 11.15am. As the station was only about 500 yards away from the Borden house, they arrived there pretty quickly. Officer George Allen was the first to arrive, where he did indeed find Andrew Borden dead in the sitting room. His witness statement would later say, He was on the lounge with his face turned upwards, several cuts long and deep on the left side of his face. It seems that Officer Allen arrived on the scene just as Dr Bowen was leaving, who had since arrived home and been given the message by his wife and rushed over. After a quick look at the scene, Allen headed back to the station to report to the marshal the brutality of what he'd seen. Dr Bowen would say that Lizzie told him upon arrival at the house that the father had been stabbed. He went into the sitting room to assess the situation himself, but could tell pretty much immediately that there was no way Andrew was alive, although he did look for a pulse to confirm this. By this time, Bridget had arrived back home and he ordered her to go get a sheet to cover the body. Lizzie then asked Dr Bowen to telegram her sister, who was staying with friends in New Haven, which he did. Around this point, some officers ask Lizzie where Abby was, to which she repeats the story about a note from a sick friend. Lizzie said that she thought she might have heard her return though, and so tells Bridget and her neighbour, Mrs Churchill, to go upstairs and look for her. They did so, finding Abby lying face down on the floor in the guest room. They didn't even need to go all the way up the stairs to find her, and instead they just spotted her as they ascended the stairs. As we know, John Morse had slept in the guest bedroom the night before and Abby had last been seen after he left that morning. In fact, she went upstairs at about 9.30am to make the bed and likely would have been attacked shortly after she entered the room. The attacker would have entered after her and attacked her with a hatchet, striking her on the side of her head as seen by a cut above her ear. Everything about the scene suggested that Abby was facing her killer at the time of the attack she would have seen exactly who it was. She then spun around in the process of her attack, probably trying to protect herself, and fell on her face, which caused several contusions on her nose and forehead. The killer then likely straddled her back and hit her 19 times in the back of the head. This murder was absolutely brutal. In contrast with Andrew's murder, in which his face was completely destroyed, Abby's face was barely touched, other than the injuries from falling on it. She would have died at least one whole hour before her husband did, probably even an hour and a half before. Whoever killed this pair either left the house after this and then returned to kill Andrew, or remained in the house undetected by Lizzie, Andrew and Bridget. Unless, of course, the one responsible was one of them. About the events of that morning, Assistant Marshal Fleet, who attended the scene, would say the following in a statement. He said he arrived just before midday, finding Mr Borden dead on the lounge with his head badly cut. He then went upstairs and found Mrs Borden dead on the floor between the bed and the dressing case, facing downwards with her head badly smashed. Assistant Marshal Fleet saw Lizzie in her bedroom on the same floor, who was sitting with her minister, Minister Buck. He asked her if she knew anything of the murders and she said she knew nothing further than her father came in about 10.30 or 10.45am and that he seemed quite feeble at that time. She helped him onto the sofa and advised he have a lay down. She said that at the time of the murders she was ironing handkerchiefs in the dining room before heading to the barn on the property. The same barn I mentioned earlier in which Lizzie liked to spend time with the pigeons. She said she stayed in the barn for about half an hour before coming back in, at which point she noted that Bridget had gone upstairs. When she came back into the sitting room, she found her father dead on the sofa and at that point called Bridget down. Fleet asked Lizzie if she'd seen anyone around the house that day, to which she says she hadn't. He also questioned her as to who Mr Morse was, to which she says he's her uncle who'd stayed the night before but left before 9am and didn't get back until after the police had arrived. Fleet notes that Morse could not have known anything about the murder. 
When Fleet asked Lizzie if she had any idea who had done this, she says, No, I do not know that my father had had trouble with anyone, but about two days ago a man called and they had some talk about a shop and father told him he could not have it for that purpose. The man talked as though he was angry, didn't know who he was, did not see him, could not tell all that he said. A man came here this morning about nine o'clock, I think he wanted to hire a store, talked English, did not see him, heard father shut the door, and think the man went away. And of course, Fleet wasn't the only officer to interact with or talk to Lizzie that day. Multiple officers questioned her, to which they all said that she was unusually calm and collected considering the events of the morning. She also had somewhat of an attitude, getting offended when one officer asked her the last time she saw her mother. Lizzie responded something along the lines of, Mrs Borden was not my mother, she was my stepmother. My mother died when I was a little girl. Despite all of the people talking to her in this time, no one noticed if her clothes were blood stained or blood splattered. You'd think this would be something people would notice if it were the case, but nobody noted that she had any blood on her. Eventually, Dr Bowen had to give Lizzie some bromo caffeine to calm her nerves and she lay in bed. About two hours after she made her original statement to Assistant Marshal Fleet, he wanted to search her room, but she was sick and so officers didn't want to disturb her too much. As a result, they didn't search her room properly at this point, instead only conducting a quick cursory search, finding nothing suspicious. This failed search would later come under fire at the trial. They didn't do their jobs properly because they didn't want to disturb Lizzie. However, they did search the barn, something which would also later come under fire. They noted that one officer went to the barn and found no footprints in the dust. There was nothing to suggest that anyone had been there earlier that day. However, other officers seemed to have searched the barn before this and he didn't note their footprints either. Over the course of all her different questionings, Lizzie's story surrounding her time in the barn that morning would change. The time she'd been in there changed from half an hour down to 20 minutes and she reported that she was looking for iron or tin at first, apparently to fix the screen door, before changing that to instead she was looking for lead sinkers, fishing equipment, for a fishing trip she had planned the next Monday. At the inquest, she would later say in questioning that after she'd finished looking for the lead sinkers, she didn't immediately head back to the house. Instead, she went to the west window of the barn, where she pulled down the curtain a little and ate some pears. She hadn't eaten breakfast, so was hungry and took some pears from the tree on her walk to the barn. This story was questioned at length. The transcript of Lizzie's questioning at the inquest is available online and I'll link it as always. And the examiner just seems to be incredulous to the fact that Lizzie just sat in the barn eating pears for a bit. Like, it's the craziest story in the world. He keeps trying to catch her out at the fact that she was eating pears whilst looking out the window but the line of questioning doesn't really lead anywhere, it's quite strange. He's clearly trying to catch her out because he thinks she's lying, that she was actually in the house killing her father at the time, but the amount of time they just keep asking questions about these pears, it's a bit ridiculous. It's also noted repeatedly that the barn was very hot that day though, possibly the hottest place on the property, and not only was this a standard August day, they were experiencing an unusual heat wave. The heat inside the barn may have been unbearable, too unbearable to sit there and relax eating pears. In the basement of the house, investigators discovered two hatches and two axes. Not unusual in itself, most families in the 1800s and into the 1900s had hatchets and axes for regular household needs. I mean, it's the reason why so many axe murders happened around this time. Assistant Marshal Fleet set aside one of the hatchets as being the possible murder weapon, and then a third hatchet was also found, but this would come to be known as the handleless hatchet, because the handle had been snapped off, apparently fairly recently. This hatchet head was found inside a toolbox inside the coal cellar. Had someone tried to hide it in there? This entire cellar was covered in some kind of ashy residue, sort of dust-like, but this handleless hatchet was noted as being covered in a different type of ashy residue. It was much coarser. Almost as if someone had staged it, purposefully broken off the handle and smeared the head with the residue. This was later presented at the trial as the possible murder weapon. 
After the scene had been searched and documented, the medical examiner was called in. The post-mortem was actually held on the family's dining room table of all places, and their stomachs were removed to be sent to Harvard Medical School to look for signs of poison. None was found, although of course testing standards of 1892 are nothing compared to today, so I'd be very intrigued to know if they would find signs of poison in a 2021 autopsy. It seems that they also tested the family's milk and found no signs of poison there either. Emma Borden arrived back home by 5.30pm and stayed in the house that night with Lizzie and their friend Alice Russell. John Morse also remained in the house, staying in the other guest room in the attic. Officers were stationed outside the house to keep an eye on it and make sure nothing happened. And the only strange thing reported all night was by one officer who reported seeing Alice and Lizzie go into the basement. It was likely to go to the toilet. They returned, but 15 minutes later, Lizzie went down again, alone this time. Maybe she had a small bladder? Maybe? The next day, Emma and Lizzie, now in possession of their father's fortune, posted a $5,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of their parents' murderer. And on the 6th of August, they held a funeral for their father and stepmother, in the very same sitting room Andrew had been murdered in. The bodies weren't buried though, they were just retained in holding vaults, just in case the investigation required them. This same day, a proper top to bottom search of the Borden house was finally conducted, only about two days too late. They find the handleless hatchet again, which had been left in the basement, and this time took it to the station for further analysis. But other than that, they found nothing they deemed useful. Although Lizzie was probably a obvious suspect from the very beginning, she wasn't the first person they looked at in this case. In no surprise to anyone, the first person they actually arrested in this case was an immigrant man from Portugal. It seems that this man was a labourer who had visited the Borden's house earlier that morning and had asked for the wages that he was owed. Andrew told him that he didn't have any money and to come back later. I mean, to investigators, it was obviously a man who'd committed these murders. A woman wouldn't be capable of such atrocities, especially a woman who was a Sunday school teacher at the local wealthy Central Congregation Church. However, it wasn't long until the suspicion against Lizzie Borden became undeniable. Her answers to questions always contradicted the last. At first, she reported hearing a groaning kind of distress call before entering the house, and then she reported hearing nothing. There was no sign of the so-called sick note that Lizzie claimed Abby had received that morning, and she didn't seem to shed a single tear over what had happened. And then a local pharmacist called Eli Bentz came forward. Eli worked at a drugstore on South Main Street and came forward saying that on August 3rd, the day before the murders, a woman had come into the shop wanting to buy 10 cents worth of Prusik acid. Prusic acid is a highly dangerous substance that is capable of poisoning someone in even the smallest of doses, but the woman claimed that she needed it to clean a sealskin coat. However, because of the nature of this acid, a doctor's prescription is required to buy it, and so Bentz refused the sale. Whilst he said he didn't know the woman who had tried to buy it, he did later identify Lizzie Borden as being this woman, recognising both her face and voice which did not look good for Lizzie. I'm not sure if the inference of this is that she'd been poisoning her family up until that point, or that she wanted to finally finish them off with poison, or both. And then the newspapers started reporting that Lizzie was guilty. She probably knew she didn't have much time until the police turned up to arrest her, especially as the inquest into the deaths was to begin on the 8th of August. Lizzie requested to have her family's attorney present at the inquest, but this was refused as inquests are supposed to be private. Her testimony at this inquest has led to a lot of speculation over the years, and there's no doubt that it would have been very stressful for her. The transcript of this is 45 pages long, during which time she has consistently asked question after question after question. Which, I know, is the point of an inquest, but there's no doubt the district attorney went in particularly hard on her. When he asked her about the discovery of her father's body, he didn't hold back. He detailed the bloody face, the fact his eye was hanging out of its socket. Lizzie struggled to respond, having to compose herself with her hands over her face for a few moments. 
And Lizzie's answers are all over the place. She's very jumpy and inconsistent. However, it later transpired that she was given morphine to calm her nerves before she took the stand. And it's suspected this may have affected how she performed in questioning. She denied being a woman who tried to buy the Prusik acid at the pharmacy and she denied any knowledge of the hatchets. When asked about the blood on one of the hatchets found in the basement, she detailed the story I mentioned earlier of how her father had likely used it to decapitate pigeons in the barn. She 100% knew by this point that she was the prime suspect in this case, mostly because the mayor and the city marshal had turned up at her house to warn her and her sister to be careful. She asked them straight up at that point if there were any suspects and the mayor replied, yeah, you. The arrest came a couple of days after the inquest on the 11th of August and Lizzie was taken into custody. The next day she entered a plea of not guilty and was taken to jail in nearby Taunton. She returned to Fall River for her preliminary hearing on the 22nd of August, at which point the judge declared her probably guilty and ordered her to face a grand jury for the charge of murder. The grand jury would meet and begin hearing evidence in November and Lizzie was indicted on December 2nd. The trial began in New Bedford on the 5th of June 1983, almost a year after the murders, and Lizzie was locked up in a tiny jail cell for that entire time. The opening statement for the prosecution detailed a number of reasons why Lizzie was guilty in this case, including her bad relationship with her stepmother, her alleged visit to the pharmacy, the conversation at Alice Russell's house the night before the murder, the search in the barn which showed no footprints, the fact that the dark blue silk dress Lizzie presented to the police as being the dress she was wearing at the time of the murders, was not the same light blue cotton dress that she'd actually been wearing. And there was also the handleless hatchet and the lack of motive for anyone else to have committed this crime. The trial lasted for 15 days and I'm not going to be able to detail every second of it here for you, but I'll leave links down below to the transcripts just in case. Of course though, I'm covering all of the key points in this video. The defense didn't have quite as many points to cover in their opening argument. Regardless of whether you believe Lizzie to be guilty or innocent in this case, I do think her defence team was actually pretty poor. They probably could have done a better job. They emphasised that Lizzie was a good, godly woman who attended church and did charity for the community, that she had no real motive and there was no actual evidence in this case. If Lizzie hated her stepmother so much, why was her father dragged into it as well? Why did she kill him? And whilst one of the prosecution's arguments was that no one had seen a killer escape from the Borden house that morning, no one saw Andrew leaving the house that morning to go for a walk either. It's not like the house was under 24-7 surveillance. They mostly focused on the fact the prosecution had no actual evidence that Lizzie was guilty. It was all circumstantial. One of the main points of contention at this trial was the handleless hatchet, which was presented as the murder weapon, even though they weren't exactly sure of that, it was very weird. It was speculated that Lizzie had broken the handle of the hatchet because it was covered in blood, and then went to lengths to make it look like the head had been untouched and hid it. Upon questioning at the trial, one of the patrol officers called Michael Mulally said they'd searched the attic in the aftermath of the attacks, and had actually found the corresponding handle to the hatchet head in the attic. Apparently it was very clear that this information was brand new to all of the attorneys in court that day, both the defence and the prosecution. This brand new information prompted them to recall John Fleet to the stand, who said that he was unaware of the handle ever being found. It became quite clear at this point that the police didn't quite have a full handle on the investigation if you pardon the pun. They sent an officer to the house to find this handle again, but apparently they were denied entry by Emma Borden. And it's still not clear to me if this handle actually exists or not, but it certainly placed doubt in the mind of the jurors. The other main piece of evidence against Lizzie Borden came up at the trial courtesy of Alice Russell. When Alice first took the stand, she spoke of Lizzie's visit to her the night before the murder when she said that she was scared someone was going to burn their house down. This evidence is interesting to me in itself. If Lizzie was indeed planning on killing her father and stepmother, why would she incriminate herself by telling someone that she expected they were going to die or get hurt soon? 
You could argue that she was trying to cover her tracks to place suspicion on a mystery business rival of her father's, but Lizzie doesn't strike me as someone who was unintelligent. Lizzie actually seemed pretty smart and probably would have known that by saying this, she just looked more suspicious. Was she really genuinely worried about their home being attacked? Or was she stupid enough to say something like this the night before she committed murders that she clearly planned for a while? But anyway, that's not even the damning evidence Alice came forward with. Alice said that on Sunday the 7th of August she walked into the kitchen of the Borden home to find Lizzie tearing apart a blue dress. Lizzie told her that the dress was covered in paint and that she was going to burn it. She'd been meaning to get rid of it for ages. This, coupled with reports that Lizzie was wearing a blue dress on the morning of the murders and apparently presented the wrong dress to the police's evidence, is incredibly suspicious. However, Lizzie wasn't exactly getting rid of this dress in secret. She did it in plain sight of officers who were still on the scene. Alice was actually first questioned by an officer the next day on the 8th of August and lied about whether she knew of Lizzie destroying a dress. Over the next few months, the inquest, the preliminary hearings and the grand jury proceedings, Alice never mentioned anything about this dress. It was only at the trial when she finally cracked and said she'd seen Lizzie burning a dress. I imagine this point of the trial as being one of those points in a courtroom movie where the whole room just audibly gasps. This was completely new information. Emma Borden stood by her sister throughout everything and she refused to believe that Lizzie could have been responsible for such a horrific crime. Emma was the star witness for the defence and testified that it was at her suggestion that Lizzie actually burned the dress that day. She said she'd noticed the dress in the clothes press and reminded Lizzie that it needed taking care of. It had been staying the previous spring and had just kind of been hanging around since then. If you're to believe Emma, then Lizzie was telling the truth. It was an old paint stained dress. But do you believe her? My main question is where was this dress in the search? If my calculations are correct, the police would have conducted their proper search the day before this on the 6th of August. So surely they would have found the dress then. The obvious implication here is that the dress was blood stained, not paint stained. It was the dress that Lizzie was wearing when she committed the murders. If this was the dress, where did she hide it? Other evidence presented at trial includes the skulls of both Andrew and Abby, to which Lizzie fainted at the sight of, and the trip to the pharmacist. However, the judge declared this as inadmissible. The incident was apparently too remote to have any connection. However, it did just happen the day before, so I'm not sure why the judge ruled that. Lizzie's inquest questioning was also ruled as inadmissible and could not be used at the trial, so they had to start from the very beginning. At the conclusion of the trial, Lizzie was asked if there was anything more she wanted to say, and she just said, I am innocent, I leave it to my counsel to speak for me. Then the jury was dismissed on the 20th of June, 1893. At about 4.30pm that very same day, after just an hour and a half of deliberation, the jury was brought back in with a verdict. Lizzie was found not guilty and was acquitted of the murders, leaving the courthouse that day as a free woman. Despite this, Lizzie Borden continues to remain the prime suspect in the murder to this very day. The case was never reopened and investigators never put any more effort into exploring other options. It was Lizzie, or it was no one. Even her own defence lawyers never put her on the stand, nor did they make any attempts to accuse anyone else of the crime. There's plenty of speculation around this case, where Lizzie may have done what she did or didn't do. Some suggest that she was abused by her father, both physically and sexually, which drove her to her actions. Of course though, there's no proof of this, and this kind of taboo subject never would have been broached at the time, so who knows if it could be true. It may well be, or it may well not be. If this is the case, maybe one day Lizzie just snapped, and out came over three decades of anger. Another possible motive mentioned is that Lizzie may have overheard the conversation between her father and John Morse the night before. They were up late talking business in the sitting room with the window open. Perhaps Lizzie overheard something which made her feel like her inheritance was being threatened. I have no doubt that being an unmarried woman who didn't work, she would have kind of been depending on daddy's money to get her through the rest of her life. There's no doubt that Andrew's frugality caused lots of friction in the house, 
and then when he invested money and property on her stepmother's side of the family, I can only imagine the kind of arguments this caused. However, this idea that overhearing this conversation between her father and her uncle led to the murder doesn't quite make sense if you also believe that Lizzie may have been poisoning her family in the days leading up to it. As we all know, poison is usually a female murderer's weapon of choice. It's less messy, it's easy. But if it was indeed Lizzie at the pharmacy that day, she couldn't get her hands on prusic acid and so decided to go the messier route of the hatchet. Or maybe they really did just have a touch of food poisoning and it was all a coincidence. Or maybe it was someone else entirely poisoning their milk. Other potential theories include that she suffered with epilepsy and was in an epileptic fit at the time, I don't have a clue where this theory comes from, or that she was in a fugue state, that she disassociated from herself and genuinely had no memory of the incident, which could also link back to the sexual abuse theory. Or there's people who suggest that Lizzie's sexuality was a reason why she did what she did. Rumours fly nowadays that Lizzie was a gay woman who was having an affair with their maid Bridget and was caught in the act. She had to kill her parents in order to keep her secret, perhaps they threatened her, perhaps she thought she'd be disowned and lose the inheritance. It's not crazy to think that Lizzie might have been gay, she definitely never showed any interest in men and she was considered a spinster, she was unmarried. But then again, so was her older sister. If you're going by that theory, Emma might have been gay too. There's no way of knowing today exactly what Lizzie's sexuality was, the same as we have no way of knowing the actual motive behind this crime, if she's the one who committed it. There are so many ifs and buts in this case that we're just never going to know the answer to. Many speculate that the only reason Lizzie was ever acquitted was because she was a lady, and it was downright unbelievable to an all-male jury that a lady could ever commit such a brutal crime. And not only was she a lady, she was a high-class, wealthy lady. For me, the one thing which hangs over this entire case, the biggest question that pours suspicion on Lizzie, is the sick note that she alleged that Abby received that morning. The reason why Abby apparently wasn't in the house. Why would Lizzie lie about such a thing if she's not the one responsible? The sick note was never found and they never found the sick friend. She just didn't exist. But then again, the police work in this case wasn't exactly 10 out of 10, so maybe they just missed it? Maybe? But there is a chance, of course, that Lizzie wasn't the killer at all. As we've already covered in this video multiple times, Andrew was a businessman with plenty of rivals. Perhaps the concerns that Lizzie voiced to Alice the day before the murders were genuine, perhaps strange men really had been seen hanging out around the house. Whilst it's unbelievable to think that someone could have snuck into the house, killed Abby, waited an hour and a half and then killed Andrew is unlikely, it's not impossible. This house was a bit of a maze, I'm sure there would have been plenty of places for someone to just hide and wait. As we know, Bridget was outside the house cleaning the windows, Lizzie was in the barn. The house wasn't exactly crawling with people. I don't think the idea that someone could have hidden inside is to be completely dismissed. Maybe there was someone in town who could really benefit from Andrew being dead and maybe Abby died as a result of just being there. Maybe she caught the person in the house or maybe this person thought that she might be privy to Andrew's business dealings. Other suspects include Bridget herself, the maid. Perhaps she was sick of being treated badly by the Bordens and snapped that day. She was sick, it was incredibly hot, and Abby had just ordered her to go and clean the windows inside and out, a laborious task. Maybe this was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Bridget definitely had the opportunity to commit the murders, but did she have the motive? Bridget eventually moved to Montana after the case concluded, and she died there aged 66 and never discussed the case with anyone. Or there's John Moores, who just happened to be in town visiting on the day of the murders, and he didn't exactly visit often. John Morse had a very good alibi for the time of the murders, but some people argue that it's too good, it's too precise, it seemed planned. At about 8.45am, he set off on foot to visit his niece nearby at the Emery house, only to find that she'd been taken ill. He spends time at the Emery house until about 11.20am, at which point he heads back to the Borden's house for dinner, taking a streetcar back and arriving just before midday, at which point the bodies were already being examined. 
It's even suggested that his alibi was so detailed that he had memorised the number of the streetcar. Why on earth would he pay attention to such a thing unless he's trying to make himself look like he was elsewhere? John claimed that when he arrived back at the house, he didn't notice any unusual going-ons, including the multiple police officers there. So he just arrived, strolled around to the back of the house to pick a couple of pairs before entering through the side door. It was only then when he spoke to Bridget did he notice anything strange going on. His story has raised many questions over the years. Was it possible that he snuck back to the house at some point to commit the crime before continuing with his alibi? That's pretty unlikely, but maybe he knew that a murder was going to happen, so ensured that he was out of the house and busy at this specific time. Was this all a collusion with Lizzie or with someone else entirely? A lot of people point to his background as the trained butcher as being very suspicious, but obviously butcher does not equal murderer before any butchers get offended. All in all, the police agree that John had nothing to do with it. John Morse only ever returned to Fall River to testify at the trial and then went back to Hastings, Iowa, where he died in 1912. For a long time, there were rumours of Andrew having an illegitimate son who was in collusion with John Morse, but this was later said to be proven false. This so-called son was proven not to be related to the Bordens in any way. After she was acquitted, things became a little bit strange for Lizzie. As you can imagine, in the aftermath of the trial, there was a partial public outcry and partial Lizzie getting sent actual fan mail. There was even a Lizzie Borden fan club. She had men asking for her hand in marriage, which she always declined, of course. Her and Emma went back to 92 Second Street where they continued living life as normal. However, they now had a lot of money. As it was declared that Abby had died first, her estate automatically went to her husband. When her husband died an hour and a half later, all of that money went to his daughters. As expected, Emma and Lizzie became kind of social outcasts in Fall River society. So they actually eventually retired to a house on the hill, the fancy part of town where all the rich people lived and the area that Lizzie had always dreamed of living. She had this fancy four bed house with her sister, which they named Maplecroft. You'd think they might have moved out of town to somewhere where no one knew their names and their stories, but they didn't. They stayed in Fall River. They had enough money for a full staff, including living maids, a housekeeper and a coachman. Lizzie changed her name to Lisbeth to try and escape public scrutiny, but that never really happened, even to this day. Eventually, after falling out, Emma moved out of the house around 1905 and they never spoke again. Lizzie would die from pneumonia many years later on June 1st, 1927 in Fall River. Emma died just nine days later in New Hampshire. At the time of her death, Lizzie was worth over $250,000, which is about five million today. Huge amounts of wealth for a single woman at the time. She left a huge amount of this to Fall River Animal Rescue League and distributed the rest between friends and remaining family. So that's the case of Lizzie Borden. What do you think? Is she guilty? Was she the victim of poor police work and circumstance? If I were to lean a certain way, I'd say she's more likely to be guilty than not, but I'm not really convinced. Based on the evidence presented at the trial, I do think the jury were right not to convict her. There was nothing substantial, but I don't think that automatically means that she was innocent. There was just not enough evidence to put her away. But I can't wait to see what all of you guys think about this case. Did you learn anything new in this video? Going into this, I actually knew very little about Lizzie Borden, so I'm so glad that I did this one. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you next week. Bye, guys.